And our next speaker is Pierre Zivek. Of, uh, he's the Fleet and Maintenance Manager of Transdev Australasia. Joined them in 2004. Uh, during his time with Transdev in France, he worked as National Fleet and Maintenance Manager. He's also been involved in a series of innovative projects, uh, including electric bus uh, buses, plug-in buses, and uh, the Watt Project at Nice Airport. And as fleet manager in Australasia, he's in charge of improving the maintenance standard to ensure Transdev Australasia provides the best quality results with the current fleet. Welcome, Pierre. Welcome. Thank you very much. Well, one of the good things of uh, talking in the afternoon is that I can uh, give quotation of everyone who talked so far. And I will uh, use that because um, some of the points I want to share with you um, have partially been said, and I want to emphasize on the thing which have not been said regarding the public transportation. Um, first of all, and that I uh, just want to go back to the old diesel. Um, why I'm going back to the old diesel is just because 99% of the uh, fleet of um, public transportation is diesel made. Um, and a brief history. Um, I'm going back far away on World War II. After World War II, until the early 90s, nothing was more or less done on reducing the pollution of the buses. And it's starting with the first Euro norm in 1993, for those who remember that, that uh, every three, four years, uh, I will talk about Euro norm because this is the one you're using here. That's the same in America, of course, and uh, same principle of norms, I would say. And you can see that between Euro 1 and Euro 6, uh, which have been implemented in 2014, there has been a huge reduction of um, some pollution. Um, problem is uh, that in parallel to the reduction of pollution, we start to have what I call a gas treatment system in every buses we operate. And you have on the picture here the gas treatment system um, attached to the engine of the last Mercedes uh, Euro 6 bus, and you can see that it's almost half the size of the engine. Um, that leads to the next question, what will be the next size of the gas treatment pollution for Euro 7? And the question is, how much does it cost to maintain? Um, during my period in France, as Transdev is purchasing uh, about 1,000 vehicles a year for its operation, I was really concerned about what is the cost of maintenance, because you buy once, but you maintain during 20 years. And of course, you don't have clear answer from the manufacturer on how much it costs to maintain the Euro 6 system. That's why um, we believe that we are in the middle of transition to go for electric, and that's well, I'm, I was invited, I'm very pleased to be here, but of course, that's also part of my job to explain why public transportation has to go to electric now. The way to electrification, I think it has been mentioned by Malcolm this morning and, and all the people. Uh, first of all, we are in traditional on the left. Uh, I put uh, CNG, uh, natural gas, on, on pure uh, um, uh, fuel system. Um, we've been through, for the last 10, 15 years, through hybrid vehicle. Um, advantage of hybrid was uh, the only way, uh, let's be honest, to reduce the CO2 emission because CO2 is only related to the fuel consumption. Whatever you have a Euro 1 or Euro 6 vehicle, if you use the same amount of fuel, you will have the same amount of CO2 emission. Um, so we went to hybrid. Some cities went, some didn't went to hybrid. Um, you have some hybrid vehicle, for example, in London in double decker, uh, more than 100. Uh, problem is it was not very expensive to purchase, uh, it starts to become a bit expensive to maintain. And the savings, well, when you gain 15 to 20% of fuel, that's quite interesting, but not enough to cover the costs. And you still have a Euro 6 diesel engine, and you still have the maintenance of the thing I showed you before, which means that you accumulate the uh, disadvantage of diesel and the disadvantage of batteries. That's why people now are looking to electric buses. And electric buses, I just want to say that in these slides there is written fuel cells buses on the top right, um, left, sorry, uh, on the bottom right. Uh, fuel cell buses is not an electric bus, it is a hydrogen bus, just to be clear for everyone. Uh, confusion is often made. Uh, the other one, trolley, electric bus, uh, pure autonomous, and opportunity charging are pure electric buses we have tested so far. One of the main consequences 
of introducing the electric buses uh, for an operator like Transdev is that um, on my business it changed everything. Uh, electric buses are the same worldwide, which is the first time in our history that we are operating the same type of buses in every country we operate. Um, I think that people who know the plane industry or the train industry know that, that the trains are quite similar in many countries. Planes, of course, there is no country for planes anyway. Uh, buses uh, for diesel, it was really country related. And uh, you mentioned the uh, total weight accepted here in New Zealand, which is different in uh, Australia, which is different in China, and I will explain you why, and which is different in many countries in Europe. So one of the main consequences of going to electric is that we decided in Transdev to set up um, internal laboratory of knowledge about electric operations. Because, uh, well, let's face reality, we have seen a lot of electric buses on, the, on your presentation. It's not a huge number of buses every city, so we need to share the knowledge to have the best ability to present our client the best technology. That is the, uh, and you mentioned uh, Stanford, I think, that we operate in Stanford, the BYD buses. So this is one of the operations we have in the world on electric buses. It starts to grow, as I will present to you. And I give you here some example of uh, the two type of technology we are operating. The first, uh, all the uh, top buses, uh, what I call depot charging vehicles. So that's basically um, an electric car. Uh, you're charging the night in the depot and then you operate more or less freely during the day. I say more or less because depending on the range you have, you may not be able to operate on every lines of the city. Uh, basically, most of the vehicles are BYD in the US. You have some test vehicle in northern country of Europe. You have the brand new uh, 10 series vehicle in Paris area, and you have in a former country from Europe on the right. Um, <laughs> quite a bit, um, um, I'm French, I'm still in Europe. Just um, <laughs> on the top right was a different, uh, in York, a very interesting subject. Uh, it was a sight, what we call sightseeing bus. Um, uh, due to the weather here, I'm not sure that you operate this kind. Well, I was welcomed by the rain in Wellington. I'm, I'm sure there is some good days too. Um, <laughs> but the fact is those buses cost quite amount of money to be built. Uh, they're quite old, but uh, we were asked to convert them to electric and we did. Uh, so that's why you have only six, but that's quite interesting to see that we can also convert some diesel buses to electric because more or less we have more space when we go to electric because diesel is so wide now. On the bottom part is what we call opportunity charging. And opportunity charging, I call the so that mixed. I will explain you why. Opportunity charging is basically I put as few battery as I can on the bus, and then I will feed during the line to go to the next stop. Uh, the most advanced system we tested was in Nice Airport in Côte d'Azur in France. It's the third one from the left. These buses was... Uh, let's say, obliged to stop every two stops. It was an internal airport line, and the idea was to have the same capacity as a pure diesel bus. Because one of the main thing of electric buses is that most of the time you're carrying battery and you're not carrying passengers. And that means that for this kind of bus, uh, in France, for example, the bus you have in picture here can um, have 100 people on 12 meter. Well, it's, we call that sardines, not people, because to put 100 people in 12 meters, it's quite hard. But anyway, the requirement for the client was to say, you have the right to operate another bus, but you need to have the same capacity. With a full electric autonomous bus, it was clearly impossible. Clearly impossible. We reached 55, 60 people because you don't have enough weight available. So we went and did this project of robotized arm. And you have on the left, uh, in Netherlands, the first bus uh, arrived tomorrow. Uh, articulated bus in North Brabant, we will operate 43 vehicles before the end of the year. And you have in uh, Foothill Transit in the US some uh, joint operation with a quite old vehicle from Proterra called Ecoliner, which is a uh, end uh, of line charging, 15 minutes, have 50 kilometers of autonomy. That's very good uh, vehicle. And Malcolm, uh, you mentioned Tosa. Uh, I tested this system. That's quite a clever system. It's close to the one we operate in this. Um, just a quick, very, very short, I don't want to go into detail on that, but when you go to operating charging, opportunity charging, you need to find a solution to transfer the energy. 
And as you mentioned, Malcolm, the amount of energy you transfer is quite huge, so it's dangerous. So it has to be protected, and you have to have the best technology to transfer this energy. First one is pentograph. So when the bus stop at a dedicated stop, you raise a pentograph. Well, uh, two half of a pentograph, let's say, to have the two positive and negative, and uh, you transfer the energy. Seems to be some of the technology used by many manufacturers right now because it's a well-known technology for more than 100 years in trains, of course. Second one is induction. You mentioned the induction. Oh, I did some testing in Germany. Um, <clears throat> we used the battery on board because it was not working very well, but it was a year ago, and that's evolving very fast. Third one is the robotized arm. That's the TOSA system or uh, either the uh, Watt system. Then the way you, so you store the energy. And um, I just want to mention that there is another way to store the energies and batteries that's called supercapacitors. And one of the advantage of this technology is that it is life, the life of supercapacitors is more than the life of the vehicle. You will never change them. The inconvenient is that not very don't have a lot of range. That's what we used in this airport that was supercapacitor. We're just transferring energy from the ground to the bus. And more important, we were charging supercapacitor on the ground so that we, our system was plugged on the normal grid for electrician operator. We don't need substation on this system. This advantage, of course, if you don't stop, well, you don't charge, you won't go very far. <laughs> that, well, that's problem with the electric anyway. Yeah? <laughs> Um, but one of the main points on the electric buses is that you have a wide range of technology available. And this wide range of technology drives to all these combinations possible. Point is, on a city, we don't think that there is only one technology because it depends on the lines you operate. Some of the lines you will operate can, will be, right now, operatable with a normal autonomous a bus which just charge in the depot and go on the line during the day. From what I've seen yesterday, even if it not, was not very easy to see the hills around Wellington, but I've seen some after the rain, and uh, it seems to be quite hilly, and I think that to climb uh, to the top of the mountains, and if you have longer lines, you will need to have some additional charging points. And that's part of the new business of the operation, is how do I split my fleet to have the most accurate system for every type of lines? This is a return of experience of Transdev. Um, this type of uh, slide, of course, you can have hundreds of questions. Why did I put three stars there, two stars there, one star there? Why did I ch change the autonomy? What you have to look at is on the left is a diesel bus. We all say that diesel on investment, well, nothing less expensive than a diesel bus nowadays on pure investment. Problem, you have in the middle something I just note because, yeah, trolley is operating here. We have to mention that trolley exists. I can't say it does not exist. I'm just saying that for less price, you have a TOSA system now and less infrastructure and no lines to maintain. And that's a huge cost, huge savings. After that, the auto opportunities are mixed. Well, it will depend on your choices. How many batteries do you want of your bus? How, which type of robotized arm do you want? And that will define your strategy here for Wellington and for the other country of New Zealand. And the study has to be very specific. It took us six months to do a study for a um, city in Le Havre, a, city, a port city in France, which has already a light rail. And we did a study to find a way to, to convert one line, the biggest line they have of buses. And we, find finally, uh, we are finally going to a f opportunity charging, and we will charge on the train station, the different train station. Why? Because the poor is here. We have nothing to do. That's, that's one of the ideas we can have in many cities because you have trains and sometimes you have already substations, uh, poor substation, which may not have been up to date, but after that, that's another subject. I finish on these three points. Uh, economic benefits, well, you already mentioned that. Uh, the direct operational cost of purchasing electricity uh, it's very, very, very less expensive, except if you're called, I don't know, Qatar or Saudi Arabia, where, of course, fuel is less expensive. Um, saving on direct maintenance cost, it was mentioned, of course. Economic benefits reduce of oil in potential job market creation. You mentioned that. That's quite true. 
There is no market in electric buses. It's, it's to come. Why? Because the major, uh, major manufacturers are mainly German. If you do not know Scania, and Scania MN is part of Volkswagen Group, and Mercedes is the other one brand, great brand. Problem is Germany is doing its electricity 80% on coal, so they are not really keen on going on electric because it costs them more CO2 emission that remaining on fuel. That's the reason why Germany try to move slowly, and the Chancellor has some issue with nuclear because she would like to put some nuclear to reduce so that she can go to electricity. That's a complex strategy, but she can't do that because, of course, nuclear, after what happened to Fukushima, is not very popular in Europe, where it used to be. <coughs> Second point, environmental benefits. Um, improve environmental management opportunities. Well, we know uh, that uh, pure electric in cities have a huge impact. It was mentioned. Improve air quality and reduce greenhouse emission. On the plane, when I was coming here, I read a study done for New York City, and which was published at the beginning of the month. New York did a study, how, does it, how much does it cost to convert these 6,000 buses fleet to electric? We're not talking about 600, 60, we are talking about 6,000. And the fact is, they incorporate a new point which I never thought about, is the cost of health for the state of New York. They just say, okay, we are on elect diesel for a long time ago. We never thought what was the impact of diesel buses on health of our citizens. And of course, the tax pay that because, well, you all pay for your health, I pay, but you also have a contribution from the government. What if we think about a positive impact on electricity and what will be the reduction of cost for the state? And it's 100 American dollar per, uh, per New York citizens. You can calculate, I don't know how much people live in New York. 6 million, 10 million. So you have quite an amount of money of, let's say, more than 100, or it's 1 billion per year to convert your buses to electric. Sadly, transport is only 2% of pollution in cities. So we have to work on the other subject that was this morning discussion. Customer benefits, and I finish on that, we always think about, oh, it's great to be on electric, but if you have never been, try that. That has been on a train, electric train, very smooth, very um, nice to, to be in it. I often think about people living close to stops, bus stops, people living close to bus depot. That would be a massive change for them, because if you live close to a bus stop at 4 o'clock in the morning, I can tell you, because I work on operations, so I have the complaints of people living in cities saying, at 4 o'clock, your drivers go to the toilets and let the bus running, and my windows of my bedroom is close to the bus stop, and you have this diesel engine. That will be a massive, massive change. That's it. Thank you very much.